You're watching The Radical Teachings of Jesus with Derek Morris, author of The Radical Prayer. My house should be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. These people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Notice the widow. She's giving more than the wealthy. They give out of their wealth, but she gave all she had. He didn't stop her from investing in a religious organization whose leaders were plotting to kill him. I tell you the truth, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Tax collectors and prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you, for they believed, and you did not repent or believe. Jesus didn't stop Judas, his betrayer. Instead, he washed his feet. One of you will betray me. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him. Woe to whoever betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for them if they had not been born. Welcome to part six in our series, The Radical Teachings of Jesus. I'm Gene Heinrich, one of the pastors here at the Seventh-day Adventist Community Church in Vancouver, Washington. In tonight's exciting study, Derek Morse will explore Jesus' radical teaching on the judgment. But before he does, I think my friend Dave has found something exciting in his Bible. Let's go see what he's found. Dave, what are you highlighting in your Bible tonight? Oh, hi. I'm marking one of the texts on the Sabbath that Derek shared with us in our last study. These are radical words. They're found in Mark 2, 27 and 28. Then he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Jesus is teaching that the Sabbath is a gift from God, a gift for every one of us. That's right, and, and many people have been taught to believe the Sabbath was only for the Jews, but Jesus taught that the Sabbath was for all humanity. Now, that is a radical teaching. Some people may be thinking, but wasn't the Sabbath created for the Israelites when they were wandering in, at Mount Sinai? Well, they may have been taught that, but the Sabbath was not created then. The Sabbath was created when God made the world and it's back, clear back to the Garden of Eden. Look at what the Bible says in Genesis 2, 1 to 3. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work, and God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it he rested from all the work of creating he had done. Now we notice that three things that tells us that God did regarding this day. He rested on it, he blessed it, and he made it holy. And he didn't do that to any other day. And then besides, the author of Genesis even goes so far as to tell us which day of the week is the Sabbath. Because three times in these verses, he says it was the seventh day. You know, um, I think most people would agree there weren't any Jews in the Garden of Eden so that means the Sabbath couldn't have been created just for the Jews. It was God's gift to all humanity. Yes, and in fact, that's why the Sabbath was included in the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments weren't just for the Jews. They're for all God's people. Notice what the Fourth Commandment says right here in Exodus 20 and verses 8 and 11. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them. Then he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day, and he made it holy. You know, Dave, talking about the Sabbath reminds me of Jesus' radical teaching on salvation. You know, it seems like the Sabbath is a special time where we can set aside the distractions of the world and focus on developing our relationship with Jesus. Yes, and it also reminds us where we came from. Because every time we honor the Sabbath, it reminds us that it points us back to creation. It shows us who we are and who God is. It shows that God is the creator, 
and we are his creation. Now that's true, but didn't Jesus get in trouble from the Jewish leaders because he stopped observing the Sabbath? Well, no, not really. Jesus never stopped observing the Sabbath, but he didn't observe it the way the religious leaders thought he should. In fact, not only did Jesus observe the Sabbath, but his closest followers, his disciples, kept the Sabbath after his death. Listen to these words found in Luke 23, verses 54 to 56. It was preparation day, and the Sabbath was about to begin. The women who had come with Jesus from Galilee followed Joseph and saw the tomb and how his body was laid in it. Then they went home and prepared spices and perfumes, but they rested on the Sabbath in observance to the commandment. Okay, but some people may be thinking, you know, that was 2,000 years ago. I mean, times have changed, Dave, and if I stop working on the Sabbath, how am I gonna pay my bills? Or maybe they're thinking, you know, isn't there this whole list of things I can't do on the Sabbath? I mean, what about the, what about the Sabbath? It'll just be a boring day, won't it? Well, I can understand why some might be thinking that, but I want you to notice what the prophet Isaiah says about the Sabbath. These are beautiful. If you keep your feet from breaking the Sabbath, and from doing as you please on my holy day. If you call the Sabbath a delight, and the Lord's day honorable, and if you honor it by not going your own way, and not doing as you please, or speaking idle words, then you will find joy in the Lord, and I will cause you to ride on the heights of the land, and to feast on the inheritance of your father Jacob, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Now, you see, when we observe the Sabbath the way God intended, it's the best day of the week. Well, you know, that's certainly been true in my life. You know, I can remember when I discovered the Sabbath, and I was just amazed at the healing and the wholeness that came on the Sabbath day, and I was so excited about it, I couldn't wait to share it with the people I cared about. Can you remind us how we can learn the texts in the Bible that talk about the Sabbath, and how can we share those with the people we care about? Sure. Remember what we do is we go to the blank page in the back of our Bible where we started marking the text to begin with. And now we're going to put down the title, God's Special Day, Mark 2, 27 and 28, and then we'll put the abbreviation SD for special day for this text. Then we're going to go to Matthew, and I mean to Mark 2, and we're going to underline that passage and highlight it. And then in the margin beside it, we're gonna write our next text that we go to, which would be Genesis chapter two, verses one to three. And we'll put the SD by it for God's special day. And we'll do that for each text so we can go through the whole study just by following those places it tells us in the next, in the next chapter. Well, you know, uh, Bible marking seems to be one of the easiest ways to help people learn where the texts in the Bible are about a particular topic and then to share those with their friends. What if people wanna learn more about Bible marking? Can we help them with that? Why, sure. They can go to our website, theradicalteachingsofjesus.com, and they can download the instructions and the very texts that we will be sharing with our local audience. Oh, very good. Friends, as we study the radical teachings of Jesus, you're going to discover things that you may have never heard before. In a world longing for change and looking for hope, the radical teachings of Jesus will give you what you need to weather any crisis. And that's why Dave and I wanna share with you these tools so that you can share this hope with the people you care about. You've heard that it was said that the God of the judgment is an angry and mean God. You've heard that the, the good news is Jesus and that the bad news is judgment. But what did Jesus say? In today's exciting study on the radical teachings of Jesus, Derek Morris will cut through the misconceptions, open God's word, and reveal to us Jesus' radical teaching on the judgment. But before he does, my friend Dan Searns is gonna introduce you to someone whose life is already being transformed by the radical teachings of Jesus. Dan? Thank you, Gene. When Sierra Kaelson was five years old, her grandmother took her to Sabbath school two times. 
She loved it. She drank it in. She kept singing the songs and praying to Jesus. But that was the full extent of her religious upbringing. Then about a year ago, a series of events began to reawaken that desire to know Jesus. Her great-grandmother on her deathbed looked at Sierra and said, please don't wait as long as I did to learn these things and to follow Jesus. Her grandmother was right over here in Portland Adventist Medical Center at age 84 on her deathbed and made Sierra promise that she would start learning the ways of God and the Bible and follow Jesus at a younger age. And then her grandparents moved to the area and began bringing her to this church. And after potluck, she met a pastor who said he had studied the Bible with her. Last fall, she had attended a Revelation seminar at Fort Vancouver High School. And through this series of events, she had that reawakening of that desire that she got when she is just a little girl to love Jesus with all of her heart and to follow him. It began impacting her home and her family. They began to bring, she and her husband, Jaron, began bringing their little children to the Sabbath school week by week. And then she noticed that her three-year-old had a hard time understanding what the Sabbath was all about. And so she got a good hurricane candle. And as the sun would set on Friday, they'd light the candle and she'd say, it's the beginning of our special time with Jesus. And that candle would burn all the way through until sunset on Saturday when she'd blow it out and say, this is the end of the Sabbath. We now have this week to look forward to the next Sabbath. And then they also had extended family who were staying with them. And they said, if they're going to be staying with us, we want the whole household to be moving in the same direction together. And they have begun having three family worships a week, three Bible studies right in their own home with all of their family so that they can grow in the ways of God. Sierra's husband, Jaron, says in the very near future, he wants to take these same steps that his wife is taking. But now, Sierra, because you love Jesus with all of your heart and you're determined to not wait until your deathbed, but you're determined right now to live for Jesus and raise those children to follow him and to be an influence in your home and community, we now have the privilege of baptizing you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. And if you hear tonight or watching on the internet or on the satellite, sense that God wants you to take those childhood experiences or those influences he's been surrounding you with and you want to begin acting. You want to begin acting on it. You keep coming to these meetings. You keep making decisions and we will help you with the next steps in following Jesus all the way. God bless you. Now we're going to enjoy some music from Carl Parker. Behold the Lamb of God Who takes away the sin Who takes away the sin Of the world I have seen and testified That this is the Son of God Who takes away the sin of the world I saw the spirit from heaven descending like a dove I saw the spirit from heaven and he remained upon him. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin, who takes away the sin of the world. I have seen and testified 
that this is the Son of God who takes away the sin of the world. Behold the Lamb, the Lamb of God. Behold the Lamb, the Lamb of God. Behold the Lamb, the Lamb of God. Welcome to the continuation of our life-changing journey on the radical teachings of Jesus. If you've been with us through this series, you've learned wonderful truths, that what Jesus taught about himself, what Jesus taught about the scriptures, and what Jesus taught about salvation, what Jesus taught about his return, and what Jesus taught about the Sabbath. And if you missed any of those presentations, you can go to our website, theradicalteachingsofjesus.com. You can share those messages with other people so that their lives can also be blessed. But today, I want to share a most encouraging message with you. What Jesus taught about the judgment. When I was 12 years old, I had to stand before a judge. And let me tell you, I was terrified. My knees were shaking. Sweat was running down my back. I sensed impending doom. And I hadn't even done anything wrong. Someone had stolen my bicycle at the swimming pool. But I remember as I stood before that judge, he had this big black gown on, and he was seated way up high. He looked like an eagle, just waiting to swoop down and get me. And, and I was fearful. Close to his right hand, he had, had a gavel. And, and I... I'd, I just knew that he was going to strike me with it, even though I hadn't done anything wrong. In fact, uh, at my young age, standing before the judge, his gavel looked like this. <laughs> you know, many of us, when we think about the judgment, we think of God like this, just waiting to strike us. We've heard Bible texts that speak about the judgment, like the one in Revelation chapter 14, which speaks about the judgment that surely will come. Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come. Perhaps we've heard this text in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10, which tells us, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. And so, and maybe in our minds, we've imagined God with his gavel just waiting to strike us down. And so it might seem startling to you to know the radical teachings of Jesus about the judgment. Because Jesus will tell us that the judgment is actually good news. There's no doubt that Jesus believed that there would come a judgment. Listen to his words in Matthew chapter 11, beginning with verse 21. Matthew 11, beginning with verse 21, Jesus says, Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida! These are towns. 
For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, that was outside of Israel, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. You saw all of these things and you did not repent. Verse 22 of Matthew 11. But I say to you, it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, who are exalted to heaven, will be brought down to Hades, that is the grave. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I say to you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. You read the story of Jesus and his ministry in the gospel record, and you discover many miracles of Jesus are performed in Capernaum. And Jesus is saying, why do you not believe? You cannot just write off Jesus as a lunatic or a malicious deceiver. The testimony is clear, as we heard in the word of John the Baptist. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Matthew 11, verse 24, But I say to you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. And then over in Matthew chapter 12 and verse 36, Certainly Jesus taught a judgment was coming. He says, I say to you that every idle word men may speak, they will give account of it in the day of judgment. You say, Derek, that's bad news. Who here has not spoken an idle word? Who here has not spoken corrupt communication? Perhaps some here have even blasphemed the name of Jesus. And I have to give account for every word? Why, I could understand why there would be people who would think of God like this when they think of the judgment. But I want to share with you some wonderful news today from the radical teachings of Jesus that shows us that the judgment is good news. We're looking in John chapter 5. In verse 22, as we begin the good news that Jesus taught about the judgment. In fact, we're going to discover three pieces of good news as we study the radical teachings of Jesus today. John chapter 5 and verse 22. Jesus says, For the Father judges how many? No one. You say, but Jesus said there was going to be a judgment. Uh, Jesus says we'll have to give an account. The Father judges no one. I'm reading on in John 5 and verse 22. But has committed all judgment to whom? To the Son. The first piece of good news, it's a radical teaching, but the first piece of good news that Jesus gives us about the judgment is this. Jesus himself is the judge. Now just imagine, back to my traumatic experience when I was 12 years old, shaking, standing in front of the judge. Really, his gavel was only this big. But just imagine if as I stood before the judge... I looked up, and the judge was my friend, and the judge waved at me, gave me the thumbs up, <laughs> winked at me. Would that have made any difference in terms of how I felt standing before the judge? What's the answer? Yeah. Of course. You say, well, that's my friend. Why, if I had a relationship with the judge, 
In fact, if, if, if I knew that the judge loved me and would do anything for me, oh, I couldn't even have imagined the judge being willing to give his life for me, but God so loved the world that he sent his son, and his son Jesus gave his life for me. Why? Does it make a difference to know that Jesus is the judge? Absolutely. My, that is really, really good news. If all that you learn from the radical teachings of Jesus today is that Jesus is the judge, then you're not going to have a picture of an angry God with the big gavel just waiting to strike you. Folks, if God was out to get you, Jesus could have just stayed in heaven. We'd all be damned, wouldn't we? For we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But God is not out to get us. He's out to save us. And so he sent his son. And he has committed all judgment to his son. The first piece of good news from the radical teachings of Jesus about the judgment is this. Jesus himself is the judge. But there's a second piece of good news I want you to notice with me. It's embedded in a story that Jesus told in Matthew chapter 25, beginning with verse 31. Jesus tells a story. I'm reading from Matthew 25, beginning with verse 31. Jesus says, When the Son of Man comes in His glory... Remember, His coming is certain. Remember our study on the radical teaching of Jesus about His return. When the Son of Man comes in His glory, and all the holy angels with Him... That doesn't sound like a secret event, by the way, does it? Then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from his goats. He will set his sheep on his right hand, but his goats on the left. Now, at this point, you'd say, okay, uh, is it okay to be a goat or a sheep, or do I want to be one or the other? Well, we're going to find out in just a minute. There's sheep and there's goats. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, that's the sheep, come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. How many of you want to be with the sheep? <laughs> say, yes. Derek, I want to be with the sheep. And by the way, if you think you can earn salvation, hear again the word of Jesus, inherit the kingdom. You don't earn an inheritance. An inheritance comes because you have a relationship with someone, right? You have connected your life with Jesus, and the gift of salvation comes. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. But then Jesus goes on and he says there are some uh, identifying characteristics of those who are his children, the sheep. I'm reading on in verse 35 of Matthew chapter 25. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger, and, and you took me in. I was naked, and, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when do we see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you a drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in? Or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick and, or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, 
Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these my brethren, you did it to me. Hold it right there. I want you to notice what Jesus is saying. If you read this hastily, you might say, okay, so in order to be saved, you've got to feed the hungry, give them drinks, uh, do some prison visitate. No, 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 no. You inherit the kingdom because you have what? A relationship. But that relationship with Jesus will influence your relationship with other people. You cannot have the attitude, well, you know, I, I love Jesus, I'm saved, I'm just going to try to stay holy till Jesus comes and everybody else can be damned. You say, wait, you must not know Jesus. Because in the judgment, those who have that relationship with Jesus, they weren't trying to save themselves by giving food and drink and visiting people in need and clothing the naked. It was because of that love relationship with Jesus that they lived that way. Is that right? But now I want you to notice as we read on. I'm still in Matthew chapter 25. And now in verse 41. Then he will also say to those on the left hand, those were the goats. I don't want to be a goat. Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. We're going to study about that crucial topic in part seven of our series on the radical teachings of Jesus. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not take me in, naked, and you did not clothe me, sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them, saying, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. I want you to notice an important truth embedded in this story. Don't misunderstand what Jesus is saying. He's not saying you can earn your way to heaven by running a soup kitchen. He's not saying you can earn your way to heaven by having a prison ministry. He's saying that your relationship with me, Jesus, will affect the way you live. But this is the key point in terms of the judgment. Key point number two, a second piece of good news. Jesus will identify those who belong to him. Does Jesus know the ones that are the sheep? What's the answer? Does he know the ones who are goats? Yes. You, you know, you can fool people most of the time. You can probably even fool yourself some of the time. But you can't fool God. You can't fool Jesus. Jesus will identify those who belong to him. Isn't that good news? You know, uh, remember my story with the judge? Can you imagine if when I was standing there before the judge and I'm shaking in my shoes and I'm sweating, can you imagine if, if the judge got me mixed up with the juvenile kleptomaniac that stole my bike? And he starts telling me, you, you need to stop stealing bikes. And I'm like, sir, it was my... Don't be quiet. Contempt of court. Get the big gavel. <laughs> can you imagine how stressed out I would be? If the judge got mixed up, who was who? I am so thankful today that Jesus knows who is who. Jesus knows, and Jesus will identify those who belong to him. That's the second piece of good news in the judgment. How many of you here uh, have a pet dog? 
Anybody have a pet dog? All right, someone waving wildly. That must be an avid dog lover. Well, just imagine, if you would, that, that I, I brought a hundred dogs up here right now. Don't worry, I'm not going to do it. I thought about it, but it seemed kind of scary. But just imagine that I brought a hundred dogs up here right now, and one of them was your dog. All right? You say, how in the world could you find that one dog in that pack of a hundred dogs? Could you find your dog? Absolutely. Why, you know your dog, right? Does your dog have a name? Your dog has a name. Probably, if you called your dog's name, your dog would come running, right? Hopefully. <laughs> you wouldn't have any trouble identifying in that pack of 100 dogs which dog was your dog, because you know that one that belongs to you. Am I telling you the truth? Well, if a pet owner can know which one belongs to her or which one belongs to him, don't you think our awesome Savior knows those who belong to him? Wonderful news indeed. In the judgment, Jesus will identify those who belong to him. And you know, I'm so thankful for that today. I hope I don't offend you, but I'm so glad you're not the one who identifies who belongs to Jesus. I mean, if it was up to us, maybe that woman who was cast, crumpled at the feet of Jesus, she'd messed up, she'd been used and abused. Maybe we would just push her over with the goats. But Jesus looks at that woman and he says, that's one of my lambs. That's one of my sheep. Maybe if it was up to us, we'd, we'd look at that crooked IRS agent who had more money than morals, climbed up in a tree, Maybe we'd look at Zacchaeus and we'd say, get down from that tree and stand with the goats. But Jesus looked up into that tree and he saw a sheep. He saw one to whom he could say, salvation has come to your house today. I'm so glad that, that Jesus will identify those who belong to him, aren't you? Amen. He's not going to make a mistake in the judgment. Why, some of us would look at that foul-mouthed fisherman, Peter, who, who changed his allegiance like a quick-change artist. And we would say, Peter, stand with the goats. But Jesus could look at that feisty fisherman and say, you're one of my sheep. I'm so glad because, you see, the Scripture tells us that people, they look on the outside, but do you know where God looks? God looks at the heart. And maybe there are some people even here today, someone joining us uh, via television or watching a DVD, and people look at you and they say, Man, there's no way you're going to make it, but I want to tell you, Jesus will identify those who belong to him. Hallelujah. That's my favorite Hebrew word, by the way. One of my favorite preachers, he says there's going to be some surprises when we get to heaven. That means we've made it through the judgment. He said the first surprise is that we made it. Yes. <laughs> By the grace of God, right? We made it. He said the second surprise is there's going to be some people there that we didn't think were going to be there. I mean, if we'd identified those who belong to Jesus, we might have set them with the goats. And we'll be surprised that they're there. And they're probably surprised we're there too. They say, how did you get there? Same way you did, by the grace of God. Hallelujah. <laughs> but then my preacher friend tells me there's a third surprise. There are some people that were such good hypocr hypocrites that we were so sure that they would be there. And they're not. Because you see, Jesus will identify those who belong to him. And Jesus is not impressed with flashy externals. People may look on the outside, but God looks at the heart. Aren't you thankful for that? Wow, I'm starting to think that judgment is good news. For those who belong to Jesus, the judgment is, is good news. Because Jesus is the judge. 
And Jesus will identify those who belong to him. But there's a third piece of good news. Oh, this is, uh, this is so radical. <laughs> you, you might not even believe it unless Jesus said it, but we've learned that Jesus has some radical teachings. It's found back in John chapter 5, the passage where we begun. And in John chapter 5 and verse 24, we find a third piece of good news about the judgment. And there I'm reading from John 5, 24. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life. Hold it right there. What is the word? Is, who believes my word? What is the word? Is it a, is it a, a word like love or peace? or What's the word? Well, Jesus tells us what the word is in John chapter 6 and verse 47. John 6, 47, Jesus says, Most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me has everlasting life. It's not what is the word, it's who is the word. And who is the word? Well, go back, same book, John chapter 1 tells us, beginning with verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, John 1, 14, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John 5, 24, He who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life, but it gets more radical. Look on in this verse with me. And shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. Now, there's something interesting here from the King James Version. I put the King James Version up here on the screen. The King James Version says, Verily, verily, I say to you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death to life. But if you go back to verse 22 of John 5, the same Greek word is used there. In the, New, in the King James, it says, For the Father judges no man, but has committed all judgment to the Son. And over in verses 26 and 27 of John 5, King James, For as the Father has life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself, and hath given him authority to execute what? Judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. So, I don't want to find too much fault with the King James translators, but if the same word is used in verse 22 and in verse 24 and in verse 27, and in 22 and 27 they say judgment, then we ought not to change the word in verse 24. It's judgment too. And the New King James, I believe, has it right. I know it's radical, but this is what Jesus says. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. Listen carefully. For the person who belongs to Jesus, the outcome of the judgment is already settled. Oh, don't get me wrong. Uh, judgment's not canceled. Canceled. Jesus said there's going to be a judgment. In fact, you'll discover from a careful study of Bible prophecy in the book of Daniel, Jesus called him a true prophet of God, and the book of Revelation, 
follower of Jesus receives the revelation of Jesus Christ, you'll discover that we are actually living now in the time of the judgment. And you can pick up some resources or go to our website at theradicalteachingsofjesus.com. Oh no, judgment isn't canceled. In fact, the judgment's good news because it means we're almost home. <laughs> but for the one who believes in Jesus, the outcome of the judgment is already settled. You have passed from death to life. You shall not, Jesus said, you shall not come into judgment, but you have passed from death to life. Amen. Do you remember the worst exam you ever took and you really crashed and burned? Anybody have an experience like that? You just had, yeah, I've, I had one when I was, uh, it was the year after I stood before the judge. We just moved school and, and I got dropped into a physics class and I was a year behind. And I didn't have a clue what they were talking about. It, they could have been speaking some foreign language. I just didn't know what they were saying. A and I came to the end of the school year and I took an exam and, and I still dream about that. <laughs> I mean, it traumatized me. I guess I was hoping I'd do okay. I got a 37% on the exam. <laughs> Ouch. By the way, just in case you don't know percentages, I didn't pass the exam. <laughs> I still remember that. I thought, oh man, that was just, that was a difficult experience for me. Some people think about the judgment and they say, you know, the judgment's bad news. And maybe it's kind of like imagining someone coming up to you and saying, uh, I've got a test that I'm going to give you and, and uh, by the way, I probably should tell you that only one person has ever passed the test. Bad news. But what if, what if the person came to you and said, listen, there's a test. Only one person has ever passed the test. It's me. But uh, I want to tell you, I took the test for you, and you got an A. Is that good news? I'd rather dream about that any day. You see, for the person who belongs to Jesus, you know that Jesus is the judge. You know that Jesus will identify those who belong to him. And you know that for followers of Jesus, the outcome of the judgment is already settled. You've already passed from death to life. Someone ought to say amen. amen. That's a smiley, isn't it? Because I'm not looking at myself, but I'm looking at Jesus. You say, Derek, that, that doesn't sound fair. How, how, can, how can a person get through the judgment so easily? Well, the answer is found in an ancient word from the prophet Isaiah. I've shared it with you before in our study of the radical teachings of Jesus. But Jesus is fulfilled in these very words in Isaiah 53, verses 5 and 6. Scripture says that He, that is Messiah, was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon Him. And by His stripes we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray, haven't we? We have turned everyone to His own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. I'm so thankful for the good news of Jesus about the judgment. I'm so thankful that Jesus reminds us that he's the judge. 
he reminds us that he will identify those who belong to him. He won't miss one of us. And for those who belong to Jesus, the outcome of the judgment is already settled. Oh, I want to study the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation. I want to understand what it means that the hour of his judgment has come. I want to understand that that judgment's already going on. And soon the Lord will say it's finished and he will come in glory as we studied about in the teaching on the return of Jesus. But I want to tell you, I don't need to face the judgment with fear. I don't need to have this recurring nightmare of God with some huge gavel just ready to strike me on the head. I can rejoice because for those who belong to Jesus, the judgment is good news. There's a promise of Jesus I've come to love in John chapter 10, verses 27 and 28. I'll share the background in just a moment. But Jesus says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. Isn't that good news? I was a pastor in my late 20s. Our family was living in Allentown, Pennsylvania. And I came to know an amazing woman of God named Violet Bauman. She lived simply. She loved Jesus with all of her heart. I remember the day that I went into the ICU, the intensive care unit at the hospital. Violet now in her 80s and her life was slipping away. I stood by her bed and I held her hand. And she looked at me and she said, Pastor, the Lord has me in the palm of his hand and no one can snatch me out. And I thought that's how I want to live. That's how I want to face the future. That's how I want to think about the judgment. The Lord has me in the palm of his hand. And that Lord, he's my judge. That Lord, he will identify those who belong to him. That Lord, he tells me that for those who belong to him, <laughs> we've already passed from death to life. We will not come into judgment. The outcome of the judgment is already settled. I want to give you an invitation tonight to respond to the good news that Jesus taught about the judgment. It's a decision that I believe could affect your eternal destiny. You see... Some of you listening to this message, whether you're right here in this auditorium or joining us via television, listening on the internet or watching a DVD, some of you say, Derek, I hear everything you say, but, but I've, never, I've never said yes to Jesus. And so <laughs> I don't have someone to speak for me. I don't have a savior. And right now, when I think about the judgment, it really does look like this. Because who of us could stand before a holy God without a savior? And so today, as you've heard this message, the Spirit of God speaks to your heart. And you know that you need to say yes to Jesus today. You say, well, I have all these problems, you know. Jesus will take you just as you are. He came to save you. Some of you say, I've wandered away from Jesus. I, I need to come back to Jesus. These meetings on the radical teachings of Jesus have reminded me 
I need to come back. Some of you need to confess that in baptism. I want you to think about what God wants you to do. I want you to listen now as Carl sings. And if you realize that this is a night to make a significant decision, today you need to make a significant decision for Jesus as Carl sings. I invite you to just slip out of your seat and come forward and take your stand for Jesus. Listen now as Carl sings. watching, just make your decision right where you are. Listen. I need thee every hour. Stay Say 